Well, hello, boys and girls. It's when we feel like, feel like a clock. And uh, we're we got one of the finest in the land here. Delhi right? from, from Delhi. One of the he's an Anaheim Ducks writer who I have read a lot of. Um, as you know, I love to read, especially young writers coming up and looking at which way the league is going as far as uh, uh, writers are concerned. I, I, I hope that we never lose these uh, these types of guys that uh, um, are able to take a position sometimes that is not really. Uh, favorable to a lot of people's <laughs> ears, and that's what I love. Delhi, he talks about anything, he's not afraid to say it as the way he sees it. And uh, I've absolutely loved him. And he's moving up in the world in a lot of ways, too. Uh, you got your you got a podcast coming up. Uh, who you're who you're who are you writing for and stuff like that right now, Delhi? Yeah, still, uh, still writing for the hockey writers podcast. Uh, the, the Lost Teams podcast, we are starting to record episodes so. Hopefully that'll be out within the next probably couple months, and then uh, yeah, just just living life and um, <laughs> uh, enjoying myself. How, how are you doing? I am fantastic. Anyways, check this fellow out, man. He is absolutely amazing. Ah, don't worry about it. Your wife is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a better it's probably a better picture than what they're looking at right here right now. So. Uh, <laughs> um, so anyways, we are going to be talking about free agency. We're going to talk about the draft a little bit. Uh, since he's an Anaheim guy, we're going to be looking at uh, Anaheim and where they may go. And probably talking about some big trades that are out there right now. Some trade rumors. Um, first of all, since uh, the and also we're going to talk a little bit about the Stanley Cup. Why not? We, we haven't really uh, gone into too many uh, ways. Like a lot of people... Well, I'm just going to throw it to you. Let's start there with the Stanley Cup because that was a very interesting final. And um, I've heard a lot of things that made me go, hmm. And I think it sounds like you and I are on the same page here. What did you think about that uh, Tampa winning the Cup and Dallas making it the way they did into the finals like that? Well, first of all, you got to give Dallas credit for how far they made it. I was against, I was picking against Dallas round uh from the start i i didn't think they were gonna i didn't think they're gonna make it that far i i didn't generally like the way they played during the regular season i just wasn't a believer and they they made a believer out of me at the end but tampa bay what a great team it's good to see them win i mean i i you might have thought i had a little bit of a prejudice against them having grown up in uh, a fan of an east coast team and uh, a rival of theirs in the bruins but uh, no fans in the press box, and I, uh, I'm impressed and happy for the Lightning. I think it's good to see a team like that win that's built through the draft organically and and not really in a lot of ways tried to buy their way to a championship. So I think that's good. I think that means that all's right with the world, at least in the hockey world for now. Um, and you love to see guys like Bogosian win a Stanley Cup and, and Shattenkirk. So uh, I think it was a good result in a physical, well-played series, even though Tampa really, I think, outplayed Dallas for most of the series. Uh, and Hudobin couldn't really get them to the promised land, but that was a tall order to expect against a team like Tampa. Yeah, I think they structured that team very, very well. And I'd like to also throw in that I'm very happy for Cooper. Um, after what happened in Columbus there, I've, I've supported him all the way through. I just think he's an absolute genius coach that happened to kind of, uh, get taken aback as well as this whole team in one position. Like, that's what I like about Tampa Bay there. They stuck with them. They knew he was good and, uh, they knew he was a great coach and they stuck with him. They didn't like overreact like we've seen many organizations do, uh, and, and, and get rid of them and then bring somebody else in, uh, other great organizations. I, I probably picks that up from, uh, like Stevie Eisenman was there before and look what he's did with Balsilli. He's stuck with this guy. He's a great coach too. He just, what are you going to do with that team? Right. So, yeah, they made some mistakes, Tampa Bay did, um, and and they were able to swallow their pride and go out and give a first for a guy like Goudreau, who probably on paper shouldn't be getting a first 
overall pick, but for their team, it was so valuable, and he turned out to be extremely valuable. What an impressive uh, playoffs that fellow had, plus Coleman, as we know, and then, of course, before the season started, they pick up their uh, their uh, lucky charm there with Maroon. Yeah, well, <laughs> so, that's a feat right there. Two Stanley Cups and two years with different teams. That's, I mean... I'd like to see the list of players who've done that. <laughs> there, there, there has been. I can't remember who they are off the top of my head. I probably should have looked at it. But um, that doesn't come with just luck. Uh, Maroon was in Edmonton, and I absolutely hated it when they let him go. Yeah. I, he, I, if you're talking about intangibles, like a lot of, like we talk about intangibles, you can't see the numbers on a guy like Maroon. He is incredible in the lineup. He's amazing for how he, uh, I think he could be a coach later on in life. I really do. I, I, I love what he, how he keeps the positive energy going in, in a room and, and uh, keeps it light when it needs to be and is, and is able to take it serious when it needs to be. I, I just, I just love him that way. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he played for Anaheim for a little bit too. I think he left That's maybe right. a little bit. That's right. Got of him from bad. Anaheim. Yeah, I think he. Uh, I think he might have left a little bit of bad taste in, in Anaheim's mouth and uh, in, in Anaheim fans' mouth. I think he he didn't quite accomplish what they had hoped. But I, I mean, I had certainly gained a lot of respect for him seeing how he played in St. Louis and how he played in in uh, Tampa this year. So uh, a, a guy that's a winner, clearly a winner. <laughs> Yeah, um, and then there was something that, like, like I said, we were talking about unpopular opinions. I, I like you, did not take Dallas all the way through, and um, I still wouldn't to this day. Uh, Hudobin was just absolutely insane. They got a good goaltender. Um, they were outplayed a lot, and I know that people love their big, solid teams, and you should because it is great to see big, solid teams. And there is something to be said about how Dallas made it that way. They certainly did. They got outplayed, but they did wear teams down, especially like Vegas. Mm -hmm. Vegas seemed to wear down all the way through. They outplayed them, but they did wear down because of Dallas' size. So I'm not saying size is not important, but being outpossessed consistently in the offensive zone as much as like minutes a game, minutes a game being out possessed and outshot almost every single game yet still winning. I would not call that a recipe for success. And Dallas going into this new season really needs to take a look at what they're going to do to have that not happen again next year. I would say, how about you? Yeah, agreed. Uh, I mean, you kind of saw what could happen <clears throat> with a team that really brought on the physicality last year with St. Louis beating on paper, a more skilled team in Boston, but I think you can't, you can't, there was a, not as much of a shot discrepancy and, and chances discrepancy in that series as there was this year, pretty much throughout the playoffs for Dallas. So, yeah, I think they want to tighten up their, their defense a little bit. And uh, it's still a question mark. I mean, I, I don't know, is the Bishop and, and, and uh, Hudobin, like, who knows if Hudobin's going to have another season like he did the playoffs this year. Are they either of them free agents? I, I apologize for not knowing, but. <laughs> uh, who is that again? Hudobin and Bishop, are they... Are Bishop? Hudobin is a free agent. Uh, Bishop is not. So we have the big question mark now. Plus they have Ottinger, who the kid looks like he's going to be pretty fantastic himself. Um, now the question, of course, is what do they do here? Uh, Bishop, the goalie market's pretty flooded as it is, but uh, uh, I'm sure there's still a market for Bishop out there. They could sign Hudobin and, and, and roll with him for the next couple of years while, while this Ottinger kid goes up. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know either. I, I almost think, I mean, this is probably going to be a very unpopular opinion, but I almost think you let Hudobin go. Uh, it's let a team spend, sign, sign him for what he did in the playoffs this year. Because, I mean, you could always end up like Carolina and signing him. And that was it Carolina where he, he signed as a starter and then he washed out there pretty quickly. Like, Morazic. Yeah, I'm right. like it. Just I think I think if you're Dallas, you 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 go, you stay with Bishop. You let you let Hudobin go, and then you hope Ottinger comes and relieves Bishop after a while. Uh, I don't I don't know if I would jump on Hudobin that that hard. <laughs> they I'm, um yeah, it depends on how advanced you think Ottinger really is, and uh, it's hard to get a read on that right now. 
so I kind of I'm kind of leaning that way as well. What you're saying, also because of his injury issues that he had leading up to the playoffs and all of that, Bishop's value might not all be that high right now. So you're probably we're pro- probably not getting much back. Mm-hmm. As a whole, I think Kadovin could be the better play, assuming you really think Ottinger's going to be a number one like in a year. Uh, but I'm on the fence. I e- either way they move, I we'll see. You know, yeah. that's that's really all, all all I think you can do that in that spot. So, anyways, we got talking about that. Uh, that those are really on here. Great minds, great hockey minds. Um, let's go Lion A. That seems to be the big thing. Everybody in the land's talking about Lion A right now. In fact, I've heard some from some publications and writers out there. I wish I would have wrote them down to give them some give them some props, but that uh, Lion A is almost certainly out of Winnipeg now. And this doesn't, I, I actually talked about this in a previous video where I thought this was highly likely. I don't really like the Winnipeg's way of dealing with these players, or at least the perception of it, with Truba and Lion A. They played them both lower in the lineup, and it seemed like they were trying to keep their point production down. And I think the players thought very much that. And now Lion A is like, you know what? No. And I don't blame them. So, uh, but that being said, if Lion is on the way out, do you, do you have any idea where, what, what do you think maybe the best places he could go, especially in this cap world or what they might get back for him or something like that? Uh, I think the places he could go is probably the most interesting question. Uh, there are definitely teams that need his scoring ability. I mean, the team that I cover, the Ducks, could obviously use Lion A. Uh, there's a whole, I mean, I kind of have this, uh, metaphor. It's a, this, the scores in the NHL are kind of where the rubber meets the road. There's all this, this talk about analytics and puck possession. And, uh, there are teams like Montreal who p- can possess the puck all day. I mean, to use a car as an example, they have a big engine, but there's no tires to bring it anywhere. So Lion Aid to me is the tires, the <laughs> big fat tires to, to actually make the, the car go. Uh, and, and the Ducks need that too. The Ducks are, are growing with their younger players. They're, they're working on a possession game. It's not there yet, but it's improved over the two years ago. So they could certainly use a score as, as one of the bottom teams in the league in terms of goals for. But I don't know if I'm the Ducks if I make that move because we saw with Tampa how, how growing organically, and, and I, organically is the wrong word, growing through the, gra- the draft and having your own players uh, can really help you sustain success for the long term and give you more kicks at the can. I mean, Tampa had, what, conference final, two conference finals and lost in the finals before finally winning. Um, so I think that's important, especially when you're going to be in a competitive division soon with, with the Kings, the way they've drafted. Uh, so I don't know if you give up the assets to get after Line A because you were mentioning to me, I mean, they're, they're probably going to have to give up one of their, their big defensemen and Josh Manson or, or Hampus Lindholm, which – uh, right now they seem like they're being wasted because the team's so bad, but they're kind of robbing. That would be kind of robbing Paul to pay Peter, or rob, robbing Peter to pay Paul at this point. Like they have so many holes. If they trade, if they trade Lindholm or Fowler or Manson, they're just going to have an even bigger hole in defense, which they already have to, to plug up their scoring hole. So it's going to be, I don't, I don't know if I do that if I'm the Ducks, a team that I think, uh, would be smart to do it, even though they've already made a move in, in getting Josh Anderson, uh, would be the Canadians. I mean, they, they have some space, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in the salary cap still. They, uh, they've got, let's see, not a lot of players left to sign uh, that are going to be expensive. So uh, would that be a super aggressive move for Montreal and Mark Bergevin? Yes, but like with Josh Anderson and Patrick Lyonnais and the, really a system uh, of... of puck possession and, and and generating chances that they have already, I think that would be huge for them. And they have the young prospects to give up. But to me, it's not as much of a of a robbing Peter to pay Paul situation as Anaheim would be. Yeah, well, the thing is, it's the de- what defense that they're going to give up in that trade. And I know they're going to be going for defense. I mean, they just went out and got that Romanoff kid out of Europe. Why? Because they don't really have, they're not comfortable with their defense that's coming up. The best defenseman you're probably going to get from them, I would think, unless you get Petrie, which seems unlikely. In fact, he got a ironclad no-trade clause. So uh, 
it would probably be Mete or something like that. I think that would be the only problem with Montreal. Although I totally agree with you that I think they're going to be heavily in that play. Um, they lot Europeans really like playing in Montreal because Montreal is a lot like Europe. I mean, if you've ever been there, it's a beautiful city. Um, uh, they they went out and got uh, Edmondson there from uh, Carolina, and they why people were wondering why they gave up a pick to bring him to Montreal. Well, Montreal has the highest taxes in the league, but if a player goes there and actually checks out the city and sees it, a lot of times they go, you know what, this is beautiful here, and it is. It's a beautiful city. Um, so in that regard, Lion is kind of a flaky guy, or at least that's the perception. Yeah. And, uh, in the league, something like that. And those guys are fine in Montreal. I mean, Kovalev was about as flaky as you could possibly get. And they absolutely adored him in Montreal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. I think I agree with you there. I think, I mean, I've been to Montreal many times. And uh, I think Lion A, he strikes me as a guy maybe in Winnipeg who, uh, I don't know, maybe the, the... The city doesn't work for him? Yeah, I mean, it's... it's Exactly. Sure to say it. I was yeah. going to make a comment about the media, but the, the media in Winnipeg is is really kind of a magnifying glass too, because it's really all there is to do. But in in Montreal, it's it's another different level. But there's also a lot more to focus on. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know. The Montreal media actually props up their players not too bad. Where in Winnipeg, they kind of beat them down. If you're not that Western like Shifley type guy. They beat you down pretty good. And that's why you heard comments from Lion A like, yeah, I guess I'm not a very good player. He's, you know, his sarcasm and stuff like that that he used. I personally like Lion A. I don't mind his attitude. I like a guy that can kind of say, like, yeah, whatever, uh, a little bit. I would mind, I would love him on my team if I could have it. Uh, a couple other teams I looked, I heard he was, they were going to th thinking about Philadelphia. Uh, the thing was, they were asking for Sanheim Plus. And Philly was like, eh, and they're ca they're kind of capped out. But um, the, New York, the other team I thought that definitely would be able to get him if they really wanted to do like just the sickest thing in the world is uh, the New York Rangers. Like, if the New York Rangers decided to just go all sick on us, <laughs> they've got the assets there to give like cr they got crazy assets there that they could pull a lion a out of their hat. And just imagine Lion A on your second line with Heidel and Creter. Like, my gosh, what a second uh, line. Yeah, and I mean, and you never know when, when uh, Lafreniere is going to come up. And you've also got, uh, you've got Panarin uh, on the top line. So you've got, like, <laughs> three strong lines. And I, I last year before the season, I thought New York was going to surprise a lot of people. And, and they kind of did until they made that qualifying round and then washed out. But uh, yeah. I think yeah, that that would be a smart option and and uh, an interesting, intriguing place for Lion A to go. <laughs> yeah, Dumba for Dumba for Lion A package in Minnesota. There's been rumors about Dumba taking off there. Um, there is a lot of place teams that are going to be lining up for him, no doubt about it. It should be exciting to see where he ends up. That's one of the more exciting trades that we knew was probably going to happen that we've seen for quite some since probably Duchesne. Uh, so, uh, a 22-year-old kid that'd be a 40-goal scorer. I imagine we named a couple teams there, but there's going to be a lot of teams yeah. lining up to see what they can do to pick up a guy like that. I think the trade will probably take until the end of the season when we see who doesn't get picked, free agents picked up and stuff like that. But should be fun. The yeah. draft this year. Let's go to the draft a little bit. What did you find exciting about the draft? I mean, I love the draft. It's my favorite day in the land, but... Uh, it's like Christmas to me. But what was your favorite part of that? You can talk about Anaheim's pick if you liked it and all that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll start off with them. I think they had a uh, – uh, I think if you're an Anaheim fan, you don't have any complaints. They filled – they definitely went after a need and uh, going after three right-handed defensemen, all offensively talented. They had Drysdale in the first round at number six. Uh, to me, he's – I, if he ends up Cam Fowler or better, you're happy. He sounds a lot like Cam Fowler from his uh, from his scouting reports and watching some of his videos. He's got the same kind of skating ability and edge work. He's got maybe a little bit of a better shot and better power play potential, which I think is good. Um, you, I don't think you go wrong with that choice if you're Bob Murray. Uh, 
The other guy I wanted him to get in the first round, I mean, early in the first round, maybe was Holtz. But since Drysdale was there, I, I have no complaints about that. Perot, I think, in, later in the first round at 27 is going to be a good compliment. He's that maybe turn out to be that sniper that you need one day. I like to that pick. Yeah, to get Zegris. Uh, Colangelo out of Boston, uh, a couple Massachusetts guys went after another Colangelo and more. Colangelo is the wing. Uh, I think, again, another big guy who could be. I like to pick. Yeah, yeah, he said, uh, his dad said maybe Alex Tuck. Uh, Could be. He's got to get his skating up a little bit. So, yeah. yeah, yep. Um, I mean, these are all <laughs> best case scenarios, but uh, the only pick that I question early on is Ian Moore, uh, right handed defenseman, but they drafted him straight out of high school in Massachusetts. And don't get me wrong, I actually I played in that prep school league in New England. Uh, and it's a very, very good league. I was probably the worst player in that league. Um, but that early in the draft, I think you want to go with the guy who's maybe a little further along in his development. Uh, but with that being said, he's a tall guy, another right-handed defenseman with offensive potential. So uh, let's see, he's got a year of uh, USHL, I think, ahead of him with the steal. And then he's going to Har- – was it Harvard? Uh, he's going to college somewhere. So. Yeah. Uh, I think he's going to be, I mean, a project, um, yeah. but he could help in the future. And then the guy I love, the <laughs> two later two later picks, Timo Nickel. To me, he's further along in his development, another right-handed defenseman <laughs> than Moore. Uh, he's already playing in the queue, so he's, he's, he's got that... Uh, He's got that, like I said, that development going. He's big. He can skate. Uh, I think he's a guy who you see drafted like in the mid round that can actually get to the NHL pretty quickly because he's got that skating ability, that size. I know it's hard as a defenseman to to kind of crack the NHL sooner rather than later when you're developing. But uh, the way I, the things I read about Nickel, I think he might be out of this draft the guy that kind of surprises the most people. Uh, a lot of people ask me who is who won the draft, and I I actually well actually I think Nashville did because I think Askarov is going to be the best player in this draft by a country mile actually, but um, because of that. But for overall picks, um, I, I it's on Anaheim probably thought about Askarov, but he already got Gibson there, who is an upper echelon, probably the best in the league. I mean, it's kind of hard to take another guy in that regard, but. Um, I thought overall, I, especially with their top three or four picks, I thought they did fantastic. Yeah. Um, I really loved who they picked. Uh, so going with that, what did you think? I want to talk about this because uh, I did. I what do you do you think of Sanderson getting picked ahead of Drysdale? You think that? I it's. <laughs> I think it's it's a size thing. I think you have that small defenseman, uh, that offensive threat. But, I mean, when you really look at the guys who are the most coveted in the league, they can kind of do it at both ends. Uh, when you're talking about, I mean, we're going to talk about a guy like Petrang- Petrangelo soon. Uh, when you're 5'11", 5'10", even 5'9", Krug, Spurgeon size, you can get a lot of offense, but you're, you're, you're limited no matter what in the defensive zone. You as much as you can work on it, there's guys that are big in front of the net that are going to outmuscle you. It's just, it's a hard thing to get a two-way play, a defenseman with that size. So I think that's probably the reason Sanderson uh, jumped ahead, and also just the need of the team. Uh, it's, uh, I think, Anaheim just who knows they might have picked Sanderson if he was available at number six, but Anaheim needed a right-handed defenseman, and so they picked three, including the highest-rated one in the draft. So. Uh, Sanderson going where he did, I think, probably has a lot to do with size. I've heard a lot of people comparing Drysdale to a guy like McCarr and Sanderson to a guy like Morrissey. And uh, I would definitely take McCarr over Morrissey all day. I, I actually think they should have took a, a scar off Ottawa for sure. Here's an organization that's not going to spend to the cap any time. If, if, if that type of team is going to win a cup, it's most likely going to do it with an elite goaltender. So um, for me, I would have taken a scar off. Is there any other surprises in the draft? I, I good, feel good story with like Hendricks LaPerrier, if you want to bring that up. I love that story there, Washington picking up. I really think Washington could have got a fr- could have got the steal right there. How about you? Yeah, I agree. I was hoping he'd make it to the Ducks uh, at that, uh, what, 27th pick or uh, – but I think uh, Le Perrier, 
it's scary to see someone who's had that amount of head injury or neck injury. I guess they're still not sure quite what it caused it if he's if he's actually had repeated concussions or if it's some sort of vertebrae issue. Uh, but if that guy wants to play, wants to play in the NHL, is uh, is confident that he can do it and not risk his his over, overall long term health. Uh, you love to see him make it there and get picked there because it's hard to watch a guy who's supposed to go so high and because yeah. of the fault of his own has to drop. So I was happy. I think he mentioned that he gets to play in Washington with the hero of his, like Ovechkin. So um, that was a good story. Uh, I think another good story was, <laughs> uh, Ducks fans aren't going to like this, was the Kings. The Kings had their second, I think, really good draft in a row. Byfield, obviously, is... Uh, if it weren't for La, uh, Lafreniere, would would probably have been the top pick. Uh, they got uh, Helga Granz, who's getting a lot of hype. They got Laferriere, I think. Uh, yeah. So no, they did well, and they are a great draft development team too. Uh, so it's uh, Velarde and Byfield on the same line down the road. It just blows my mind. Like if you want to talk about big forward lines that could crush the opposition, that that's. That's going to be insane. And then Kopitar, of course. And Turcotte's not a small boy either. Mm-hmm. What a top three you got there. Oh, my gosh. I agree with you there. For sure. I think it's going to be another. If, if Anaheim can can develop and uh, if both teams can get those play uh, really reach their potential, it's going to be in another four or five years. I think it's going to feel like the early uh, 2010s, 2012, 13, 14, where Anaheim and LA are fighting in the conference finals or in the conference semifinals to see who's the uh, Western Conference representative. So I think this rivalry is going to heat up again. That's one of the things I got about this draft. Uh, Which is great because we, I lo- like I've talked about a lot, I love getting the fans out there in those warm weather areas in the United States. I'm really excited about that. Uh, we need that for our, the league so, so much. And uh, our hockey uh, viewership was way up in this playoffs. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really great. I'm, it's really great to hear that. I'm glad to see the United States uh, fan base growing over there. Well, and, and I just actually a, a funny thing I noticed the other day. I think the HL season, it was the national their, their opening day roster had three Southern Californians in it, which was I don't think it's ever happened. And that's the, was, that was the second most to either Wisconsin or Minnesota, uh, maybe Illinois, but it was the second most uh, players from one state and one area specifically uh, on that opening day lineup. So it's growing here. I mean, that's kind of your I think your. L.A. Kings, Anaheim Ducks, success of the last 10 years coming to fruition. All right. I love I could go on all day about the draft, but we better move on here to uh, the the exciting time of the land. Next, free agency coming up here. Uh, there was we just did a video on 10 players that were uh, players that weren't given contracts. They they're, they're, they're weren't uh, um, qualified. Uh, some big big names there, but uh, like Ottawa there with uh, what's Declare was a good example. Didn't get qualified. There's several players like that. Go check that out. <laughs> Not now, but after this, just take your whole day off and just watch all of this stuff. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we are going. Um, what about okay? So the biggest name, of course, and I just did a video on it as well, but I wanted to get your perspective on it. Um, Peter Angelo, of course, is the big name in free agency right now. Um, how do you think that's playing out, and what do you think St. Louis uh, of St. Louis not uh, like just signing him up right away? Um, what do you think about that organization and what they're doing in this Peter Angelo situation? Well, it's probably similar. It reminds me of the David Back situation from a few years a few years ago. Uh, not necessarily re-signing their captain and and doing it for uh, expense reasons. I, I I know they're up against the cap. I think for what Petrangelo is asking for, uh, but we saw letting go of Backus ended up being uh, the smart decision. They they didn't really didn't really hurt them in the long run. And um, I think if you're St. Louis and you're going to want to sign some of these guys that are coming up, uh, let's see here. You got Schwartz coming up, although. He, yeah, you got to resign him next season. You got to resign maybe David Perron, although he's on the older end. You maybe let him go. Oh no, sorry, not David Perron. Um, uh, where is he? 
Sanford. There we go. That's the guy. Sanford. You've got some RFAs and some UFAs coming up. That you're Sanford gonna need. should be looking for a contract soon, too. And that, and yeah. that team. So. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and Dunn. Dunn. Don't forget Dunn, who I think they think can be their, their top guy in that. They, they lo- love, and I think that he can be. I, he's very underrated. Yeah, they got a sign done this year. I mean, he's an RFA. So uh, I think obviously that's why, that's always why a team isn't going to assign a player as good as Petrangelo. Um, as for where he's going, uh, to me, uh, where if I already forgot, <laughs> I already forgot. Sorry, I'm having well, the a big brain one's part. Toronto Maple Leafs, but yeah, the, does that seem realistic to you, really? No. I mean, a, well, you know Unless what? they get rid of Nylander or something like that. Right? But maybe that's maybe that's where they have to go. I mean, they had such a talented offense over the past few years, and it's gotten them nowhere. So you have to give up something to get something uh, in terms of shedding the contracts to, to be able to sign Petrangelo. So maybe that's what they need. Maybe, uh, maybe a two-way guy, one of the best defensemen in the league, is finally going to uh, at least get them out of the first round. <laughs> I mean, <Yeah. laughs> where they haven't been for quite a while. So uh I could see it happening. I mean, it just just changing things up. It, it's it's certainly a possibility. I mean, um, you you mentioned that they they teams know that they aren't going to have a lot of leverage having to get rid of a guy like Nylander, so they might not be able to and, and contract space, so they might not be able to get a lot out of him in the near term uh, for a trade. Uh, but yeah, he's an interesting guy um, that that uh, that or an interesting team that Petrangelo could end up with. He's from the area too, right? So yeah. he probably would like to play for the Leafs. So he might be motivated to drop it down a tad. Maybe not take the full nine for eight for whatever. But yeah, the Avalanche. I mean, the, you you mentioned there's a lot of guys coming up there, young defensemen, but uh, they certainly have the money to do it. So uh, we'll see there. And then I mean, there's there's a lot of teams that could possibly afford it um, that could use a little bit of a kick in the butt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, thinking of the Predators, oh, no, maybe not the Predators. The Predators have a pretty good stack defense right now. It's their offense they kind of need to work on. But, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Petrangelo is an, an interesting one to me, and, and Krug as well. Uh, Krug, not really as much of a two-way player, just like I said, because of his size. But uh, age-wise, those are both guys you're going to have to give big, long contracts. And in, by the end of the term, especially for Krug, who's, who's smaller than Petrangelo, uh, it's going to be an overpayment. So yeah. it's, it's, uh, that's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be tough to, uh, a tough pill to swallow, um, in the, sh- at the end, in the long term. It's, I think it's going to be a team that, like Toronto, who, who needs something to just put them a little bit over the top. Yeah. St. Louis, again, that they have done well to not do that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that's why I kind of lean to the idea that they won't do that. Um, if he wants to stay there, it's probably going to be a six-year contract. And um, I don't blame him for going, ah, I want the full eight. I mean, that's $18 million <laughs> uh, possibly, a nine, uh, nine. And if it's, you know, they'd have to, somebody would have to trade for his rights to give him the full eight years, which I imagine somebody would do. But uh, um, I don't blame him. I mean, it's a lot of money. And I, I hear people talk, well, you know, how much money do you need? Well, $18 million more is $18 million more. I, if you're a person and you're in that situation, what are you going to tell your son? You know, <laughs> oh, no, drop the 18 mil. Just uh, just be happy with the money. I, no, I'm sorry. I wouldn't. <laughs> just wouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's another. <laughs> uh, you look at a team like Florida, who they, they have a lot of UFAs this season. Uh, maybe that they're not going to resign. And their defense, even with their neck, Vlad and Keith, Keith Yandel, is awful. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they're going to be signed for a while. I mean, between Yandel and Ekblad, they've got they've got Yandel. Uh, Ekblad signed till twenty five, and Yandel till twenty twenty three. So, uh, putting that much of your salary on your defense is maybe not the best idea. But uh, their defense needs needs help big time. <laughs> so yeah, I, they, they were talking about not spending money though this year. That was kind of why I didn't put him in there. Mm-hmm. But if you're not going to sign Dodonoff and you're not going to sign Hoffman, and Bobrovsky was complaining like a mother that their defense was too poor, that was a problem. Uh, so that is a possibility. It's still out there. If you want to keep that guy happy 
whatever. But I mean, those owners are still looking at that $10 million a year for Bob Rowski and going, trying in their beer, I'm pretty sure. Um, so let's go with another guy and then we'll head out here, I think. Um, Cause, oh, we could go on forever, but we're not going to. Ho let's look at Hoffman. Hoffman's probably the next biggest guy off the top of my head. If you think there's anybody else, maybe. But I think Hoffman's the next biggest guy out there. Um, uh, Montreal is right off the top. It's been pretty bullish. I think Buffalo is probably going to be on on him. But what do you think? Uh, again, he's a guy. He's kind of like, uh, in terms of scoring ability, kind of a line A light. So uh, I, I do think that uh, that Buffalo and, and Montreal are he's not making a lot. Hoffman's not making a lot of money, right? Oh, no, sorry. I'm looking at his older contract. Six, he's making six. five five point one, yeah, um, or 5.2. So... I mean, maybe he's a guy that Anaheim goes after instead of Lion A because it's a free agency. You don't have to you don't have to give up anything. Uh, you've got Ryan Kessler's long term agent reserve, which can cover uh, can cover uh, Hoffman's contract for a year until uh, Anaheim frees up some more cap space next year. So we get. I mean, maybe he's a guy that they go after instead of Lion A. Uh, certainly playing in Southern California would be similar in some ways to playing in Florida for Hoffman. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, that's an option. Yeah. I, I think there's a lot of places, you know, I think, but I, I also think that he might end up getting overpaid. Um, uh, that's the one guy in this draft that might get overpaid. I could see him getting something like $8 million a year from Montreal Canadians if they can work out that kind of room. Anaheim is a good example. I mean, if he just wants to go for the money, there's probably teams that are not really in contention right now that would still uh, think that he's going to be a player for up until he they are going to be in contention. Um, I what did I have? I ha I can't remember who I had him going to, but I think it was Montreal and between Montreal and Buffalo seem to be the two big things. Uh, I think imagine him playing with Eichel. The kind of numbers that he could put up, yeah. uh, <laughs> he, the, he he doesn't get. I don't think he gets anywhere near enough credit for how great of a shot he is. Like um, the guy that they just drafted, I, I did want to talk about in the draft because I, I really didn't like that pick with Quinn. Uh, you know, is a possible. So you got to think that if they're drafting a guy like Quinn, they're probably looking for a guy like Quinn. So I think uh, Hoffman will be. Uh, up in the air are those two, but I would not be surprised if somebody comes right out of the woodwork that we're not even thinking of and throws him a contract and we're like, what, what, what? They just happen to work, get some cap room like San Jose Sharks or, you know, that doesn't want to rebuild if they can find the room somehow or just scramble around or just sign him and then try to work out the details later. Uh, and we met Colorado. For that second line on the right side, they could just go out and do something like that as well. But, uh, Deli, this has been fantastic. I, uh, I love having you on, bro. Uh, I get you. We haven't been on for a couple of weeks. Hopefully, we can do this sooner than later. Um, there's uh, your, your insight has been fantastic. I learned a lot from you, and I hope everybody else out there does as well. Um, what about that? You were talking about that podcast where we were talking about some of the old franchises and stuff yeah. like that coming up. How's that looking? Is that going? It's going well. So I've recorded one episode so far. Uh, I'm going to record another one tomorrow. And then we're trying, we're going to try to get three or four pre-recorded and then um, release them. And then uh, probably five or six start <laughs> changing it up, bringing in some guests and, and trying to get some more, uh, listenership uh, we didn't we didn't end up winning that contest the iheart radio contest but there were 18 1800 entries so um i mean our chances weren't great although i was hoping they were uh but um yeah so we're gonna do it on our own and we're, we're gonna have hopefully have it uh ready to go in the next well six weeks i'm, I'm hoping <laughs> And this is going to be a podcast about some of the defunct organizations in the NHL in the past and their stories. And I'm really excited about it. Uh, and uh, would uh, I can't wait till it comes out. That's our full not, not just the NHL, all all professional North American professional sports. So oh, sorry, all sports, right? Yeah. Okay. So it could be. I mean, being a hockey fan, I'm going to focus probably 
in my uh, my bias is going to be towards hockey, but I mean we'll go NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball. We, uh, my buddy did the the uh, Canadian Football League, the CFL. We've already recorded an episode with one of their teams, so uh, or former teams. So it's uh, it's going to be a North American sports uh, extravaganza. <laughs> right on, buddy, and I love the word extravaganza. So on that <laughs> note. This has been an extravaganza, and uh, we are going to have more extravaganzas later with Delhi. I can assure you of that. So be on your edge of your seat, and thank you for subscribing, everything like that. Go check out Delhi's work, man, and have a great day. Yep. Lots thank of love, you. too. Yeah. Have a great one. <laughs>